Now, on to today's topic. Uh, our speaker is the well-known Regina Ip, politician here in Hong Kong. I don't think I'd be stretching it if I said there is distrust, dismay, and even in some cases, outright depression about the outlook for politics and the future of Hong Kong today amongst Hong Kong people. Some people are questioning whether the one country, two systems model is actually going to continue working all the way until 2047. And how do we deal with the near future and how do we deal with the long-term future? Well, Regina Ip is one of the best known politicians in Hong Kong. Uh, she is chair of her own party. She serves on EXCO, the Legislative Council. And I did ask her what the term savantis for her party actually means. And she said it comes from savant, or to know and knowledge. Very much looking forward to hearing her speak. And as always, we'll have time for question and answers. Regina Ip. Thank you, Tara, for the introduction. Thank you all for coming. I know that Sir David Chang spoke recently in this club, and he was a roaring success. Sir David Chang is a very hard act to beat, particularly given the fact that uh, being part of the establishment, it's hard for me to give you a no holds barred critique of government performance in the way Sir David did. But anyway, I'll try my best you know, um, to speak the truth, speak what I see as the truth about our most challenging issues and the way forward. You know. A political activism spearheaded by young people is very much on people's minds. Students stole the limelight during Occupy Central in late 2014. Rapid democratic development in recent years, in particular the debates on chief executive election, have spawned large numbers of political bodies led by young people. Civic passion, valiant frontier, Hong Kong indigenous, young inspiration, Hong Kong National Party, and more recently, Demosisto, also a name invented by the young people, you know, just to name a few. The Hong Kong National People purports to promote Hong Kong's, quote, independence, unquote, Others appear to be planning feverishly to take part in the upcoming legislative elections in September. This unprecedented burst of political energies on the part of young people could be due to a combination of reasons. They might have been emboldened by the overnight success of the key players in Occupy Central, who made it to international headlines or the electoral success of a number of district council uh, candidates in last year's district council elections. We've also noticed that Edward Leung Tin Kei, who played a part in the violent protests in Mong Kok two months ago, he also won an impressive number of votes in the by-election in the new territories recently. The positions of district councillor and legislative councillor do carry a reasonably attractive remuneration package these days. You know. In the old days, legislative councillors were rewarded with only an honorarium of, uh, say, $2,000. But now a young district councillor is paid two or three times the starting salary of an average local graduate. Young people catapulted into these positions enjoy the limelight and the legitimacy uh, of being the elected representatives of the people. So I can understand the excitement. I'm all for young people taking part in the electoral process and asserting their voices by lawful means, such as by seeking elected offices. For some time, young people in Hong Kong have been fretting about their diminishing opportunity for upward mobility. Since the 1970s, the time when I graduated from university, starting salaries for local graduates have increased about 10 times. The, but the price of a 400 square meter apartment 
has increased more than a hundred times. The frustration and even anger of young people at the, who despair at the prospect of ever owning their own homes are entirely understandable. Shortage of land is a perennial problem in Hong Kong, but the unforgivable ne neglect of the need for long-term planning and production of land supply during the previous administration has exacerbated the problem. Hong Kong has one of the highest Gini coefficients among developed economies. Recent studies on income inequality tell us that income inequality is a global phenomenon. Income inequality, according to these scholars, has been fueled by globalization, the communications revolution, and what some call patrimonial capitalism. A recent study by Bran Branko Milosovic, a Serbian-American economist, finds that the greatest winners of globalization are people from the emerging Asian economies, predominantly China, but also India, Thailand, Vietnam, and Indonesia. Hong Kong was a winner too in the 1980s and 90s, but our economy seems to have peaked in by 1997, as our competitive advantage in many areas become increasingly eroded by rising costs, resource constraints, and complacency in governance. Perhaps nowhere on earth is the economic search of China more keenly felt than in Hong Kong, or the gap between the rich and poor more sorely dramatized. In our tiny territory of about 1,000 square kilometers, rich city and poor city live by cheek, live by cheek by Joe, live cheek by Joe. The daily dramatization of the lifestyle of those obscenely rich people by our media makes it hard for the ordinary men in the streets to live unaware of the yawning gap. The downturn of our economic fortunes since our reunification, coupled with the rising influence of mainland China in many spheres of our life, have led many, especially the young people, to blame one country, two systems for our apparent impasse. Unable to find a way out, some young and fearless are advocating independence. Others, wary of uttering the I word, are urging autonomy or self-determination without being able to define clearly what they have in mind. To our young people and to all those who harbor doubts about one country, two systems, I have to say emphatically that there can be no better arrangement for Hong Kong than one country, two systems. From its inception as a bold and innovative idea put forward by Mr. Deng Xiaoping, in the past 30 years, all those involved in negotiating the Sino-British Joint Declaration on the Future of Hong Kong and in drafting the basic law had worked tirelessly to produce a detailed constitutional document which contains all the necessary ingredients guaranteeing the con continuation of our unique lifestyle and separate systems within the huge country of China. The basic law is a hard-won victory for the nation and for Hong Kong. It represents a carefully calibrated balance between the national priorities of China and the unique requirements of Hong Kong. In the past 19 years, Although there have been some bumps along the way, such as the controversy surrounding the National People's Congress Standing Committee's interpretation of certain provisions of the basic law, by and large, the basic law has functioned extremely well. Hong Kong people enjoy a much higher level rights and freedoms under the basic law than in the colonial era. It also enjoys the strong economic backing of its motherland, China. In reviewing the implementation of the basic law 
Beijing authorities recognize that one country, two systems is not easy to manage, as there are many inherent contradictions and tensions. But I feel pretty sure that Beijing is determined to make one country, two systems a success. For us, we have no option but to commit to the same goal. Independence is a non-starter. Many will agree, I'm sure, that one country, two systems is definitely preferable to one country, one system. There is no denying that in recent years, fears have mounted that the role of mainland China in the management of Hong Kong affairs appears to have risen and that Hong Kong status is being progressively belittled. My response is that Hong Kong's voice in the governance of Hong Kong under one country, two systems would have been greatly strengthened if the chief executive election package had been proved, approved last June. Although Beijing's model falls short of the self-determination one would expect of an independent political entity, and I have to stress the reality is that we are not, it was the best model we could have achieved for the time being, given our constitutional reality. It would have saved Hong Kong from the drawbacks of its present inchoate democratic system, which people have described as having all the vices of democracy, but not its saving grace. Speaking as a Hong Kong born and bred person, I think it lies within ourselves to strengthen our voice in our governance. Although time does not permit discussions on arrangements for chief executive election by universal suffrage within the current term of the Hong Kong SAR government, this is clearly an issue which will not go away and should be addressed as a priority by the next administration. Secondly, we should not stop allowing the 50 years no change mantra to distract our attention from all the changes occurring around us. We have a dire need to reposition ourselves, our economy and our society in the new globalized digital era to leverage the growth opportunities provided by the economic rise of China, as well as face squarely the attendant challenges. We need to imbue our young people with a new sense of security and confidence in controlling our destiny, invoking the same brave qualities which have served us well in the past, certainly have served me well in the old days, the qualities of courage, humility, pragmatism, hard work, an open mind, an outgoing spirit, and the willingness to take risks. We have done it before, and I see no reason why we cannot do it again. The recently bought case, the bookseller, who was like uh, abducted or allegedly abducted. Okay, how would you expect to change the uh, perception? And if you were granted with more power in near future, okay, how would you do it differently in uh, promoting one country, two system in that sense? Thank you. Well, taking the first question first, the bookseller case is indeed highly unfortunate and disturbing to many Hong Kong residents, whether local or expatriates. All of us have expressed our concern to the central authorities. And we hope it will not happen again. We fully understand the damage to the perception of one country, two systems. No. And we have fully reflected our concerns. As for the second question, promoting one country, two systems. I think um, the, the Hong Kong government or, or the Hong Kong leaders at the highest level whether in government or outside government, in politics, in political circles, they have a duty to function as an intermediary between the country and the separate systems and lifestyle in Hong Kong. As I said in my brief remarks, the Beijing authorities themselves 
they recognize there are some inherent contradictions and tensions. Mr. Zhang Xiaoming, when he was in Hong Kong Macau Affairs Office uh, in 2012, he wrote an article called Enriching the Implementation of One Country, Two Systems, in which he drew attention to three sets of relationships which need to be carefully handled, including how to strike a balance between upholding central authority and safeguarding Hong Kong separate systems, and also how to promote China's developmental interests as well as upholding, enhancing Hong Kong's own competitiveness. Some people say that trade-offs between the two as China's ports on the eastern coast rise, our business as Kwai Chong suffers. So how do you strike a balance? How do you continue to grow you know, within this big framework? It is very challenging. The Beijing authorities know it. You know. And Hong Kong leaders should really function as an intermediary as, as, and as someone who can manage the continued success of the two systems within this large, populous, and rising country. Thank you. Uh, we'll go over here. Please uh, give us your name and occupation, if you feel comfortable doing so as well. Hello, my name's Andrew Wood. I'm a, I'm a journalist. Uh, I work for the BBC. Hmm. Um, I used to live in Singapore. I lived in Singapore for seven years. I've been in Hong Kong for eight years. So it's a very interesting compare and contrast. In 1965, Singapore was thrown out of Malaysia, Lee Kuan Yew, the prime minister, cried on television because he thought there was no way that Singapore could have survived without being part of the larger federation of Malaysia. Singapore's doing fine now. Why should independence be a non-starter? Because the history is different. Singapore was never part of China. We have always been part of China, even from the Qing and Han dynasty. We were part of the 36 counties established by the first emperor. It's a difference of history and geography. Singapore does very well, and I have a lot of admiration for them. You know, but the historical and geographical reality simply works against us, quite apart from the economic reality. Vietnam was part of China too. It's doing OK by itself. Pardon? Vietnam was part of China too, but I don't see any need for Vietnam to be, a remote, to be part of China again. Um, Vietnam may be parts of, I don't know enough about the history of Vietnam, but Vietnam is much poorer than Hong Kong. You know, being a, you know, they don't have our hinterland. You know. Out on the veranda, we've got a question out here. Uh, do you want to actually, if I can get you to stand up, I'd be grateful so that we can see you as well. Hi, I'm Julia Charlton, solicitor. Um, could you share with us, please, your vision, perhaps with some specifics for Hong Kong's future economic growth, and in particular, creating and maintaining Hong Kong as an international financial center? Mm -hmm. um, I think... Um, this, although our ranking has sli slipped somewhat in the survey on the world's IFC, I think our fundamentals remain very strong. You know. And I think um, we need to be more innovative. For example, I've heard and read a lot about how fintech is flourishing, not only on mainland China, which is far less regulated than Hong Kong, but also in London, which is highly regulated. But our regulatory authorities seem very resistant to change. You know. So I think fintech is definitely one area uh, which merits more attention. Uh, the government has uh, set up a steering group on the development of fintech, uh, which has just completed its report. I hope the government would take specific action to um, support the growth of fintech. And also, the government is, uh, al although somewhat belatedly, taking some measures to um, stimulate the growth of financial markets, such as some special tax exemptions for uh, treasury operations of some companies. And I think you know, we should stand to benefit from China's implementation of the Belt and the Road Initiative. 
you know, Mr. Jing Li Chun, the president of AIIB, when he was in Hong Kong a few weeks ago, he said that uh, our application to be a member, a non-state member of the AIIB would be processed in the next batch of applications in June. He said that we should be admitted by end of the year. And once um, the, Bo the Bell and Road Initiative gets underway, the financing need is massive. Hong Kong should have a big role to play as a fundraising platform in debt issue and in risk management. So I think there's no need to be um, pessimistic about our outlook just because of some um, down, downgrading. You know, um, There's a lot going for Hong Kong in the financial areas. Question from the table, Florence de Changy. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm with Le Monde. Uh, um, first of all, I was uh, vaguely hoping we could have a big announcement today. So um, I would like to ask you where do you stand with your uh, project of uh, possibly becoming a next uh, Hong Kong uh, CE. And then the second um, topic is all these young parties uh, that everyone is very interested in. You kind of uh, imply that uh, most of these young people main motivation is the salary which has increased. Um, can you say a bit more about uh, that and what, uh, what, what will they bring to Hong Kong political life and do you really think they don't have a higher um, motivation than just making good money? Um, first of all, you know, as a party leader and a legal member facing re-election quite soon, my priority is really to lead my party to hopefully a satisfactory victory in September and also get myself re-elected, you know. So um, talk of all other offices is uh, running for other offices is premature at this stage, you know. As for the young people, I think what the young people in Hong Kong lack generally is um, upward mobility, you know. I think they have good reasons to feel that they are more hemmed in than we were uh, when we were young graduates because Hong Kong was then rapidly growing, you know. Our salaries rose very rapidly. All of us could see a ladder for our, you know, um, for moving up, you know. The, the political office packages have become a lot more attractive these days, you know. And, but I'm certainly not saying they are running for office just for the money, you know. The, a lot of other things, the office carries other benefits. It's not just the financial remuneration, it's a, a status, you know. It's um, the, the, a platform for voicing one's uh, aspirations. And above all, young people tend to look at themselves as agents of change. That's very understandable. In the past 200 years, uh, a lot of important revolutions in Europe and in Asia have been preceded by students' protests. So I can understand all that, that young people want to be agents of change. But I think they need to be clear -head, more clear-headed about what they are looking for, and to be more clear-headed about their ideology, and also the constitutional and political realities about life in Hong Kong. You know? But do you think it's a good thing, sorry, for yes. the political life? It, I think it's much better for them to run for elected office than to throw bricks in Mong Kok. Definitely. You know. I'd, I'd just like to follow up on Florence's question. I, I know you won't be drawn out yet on whether you would like to be chief executive, but what type of person do you think we should have to lead Hong Kong? Is it obviously someone with very strong links to Beijing? Should it be a younger person, um, a, pol a political insider or outsider? What's your vision for the leadership of Hong Kong going forward? I think just leaving aside the, the um, quality of trust by Beijing, I think that is a given. You know, let's leave that aside and leave aside age. You know, you know. we know there are a lot of far older candidates than me running in the uh, U.S. You know. And um, age should not be a factor. 
whether it's youth or more senior years. In the past, many have stressed public sector experience. I think it's very important. Public sector management experience, real hands-on management experience is very important. But also important in this day and age of um, um, democratic politics, I think the next chief executive also needs to be more of a consensus politician, somebody who can work with the Legislative Council and build consensus within the community and in the Legislative Council so that the government's agenda can be implemented. In fact, I come across a quote which I like very much from an American politician, Jerry Brown, a governor of California, who seemed to have achieved the impossible in politics. That is, uh, in his second tenure as uh, governor, he managed to raise taxes, cut budget deficits, and also uh, secure consensus to implement uh, a, raise, a rise in minimum wage over a period. And I like what he said. People ask him, well, what, what's your secret? And he said, you know, for governance, it takes more than a few good ideas or a few slogans or some sound bites. It takes some skills. And public sector skills include administrative skills and political skills, such as what I have described. It's not just celebrity value. Francis. If you want to move things forward in Hong Kong, it's going to take some kind of agreement with Beijing. Ronnie Tong has just been up to Beijing and tried to suggest uh, opening up again, kickstarting uh, discussions on political reform. Do you think that can be done? And if so, what would it take to be able to persuade Beijing to take its responsibility for some of the things it has done to anger and, 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 and marginalize young people in Hong Kong? Um, the young people's sense of uh, being, you know, subjected to the same interlocking elites is um, entirely understandable. We have a lot of veterans in the Legislative Council, and I think they have, you know, heard these voices. A lot of my colleagues from both the Poe establishment and uh, democratic camps, they are retiring. You know, people like Emily, you know, I had dinner with her recently. She has been there since 1991. I think she wants to change herself, you know. I think this year's elections, electrical elections, the old parties are fielding a lot of young people, you know. And a, a lot of young uh, candidates from newborn groups, they will be competing. I think that's a good thing, you know. By all means, Go for it, you know. I'm all for young people having a shot at elected office or even playing a bigger role in the government's advisory and consultative system, you know. But to get things done, to change Hong Kong, you need not just passion. You need some basic knowledge and competences, you know. That's a reality wherever you are. You do need some basic competences. For example, when I was doing a radio program with a, a young politician, budding politician recently, she complained, why? Why is Hong Kong competing in sports games under the rubric of Hong Kong China? She thinks it's belittling Hong Kong. But actually it's because of the basic law giving us a special status so that we can compete in the Olympic games as Hong Kong China. London cannot compete in the Olympic Games, only UK can. But we can compete as a separate non-state party. That's a privilege for Hong Kong, not a belittlement, you know. So you also need to have some basic knowledge of the facts of life in Hong Kong, you know. But I think young people would learn. We all, they, we all have a learning process. And I'm sure once they get elected, started serving on district council or even legislative council, they will find out more about the realities of life. Yeah. The second question about um, uh, constitutional reform. But you know that um, we now have splinter groups from existing uh, political parties urging a more moderate or more pragmatic form of democracy 
consistent with our constitutional status. I'm referring to the path of democracy led by Ronnie Tong and other academics. They called on me two weeks ago. They are, they are now in Beijing talking to quite important um, officials and trying to, trying to find a way forward for Hong Kong's democratic development. And um, I can't give you specific suggestions yet, but I think Beijing did and does want uh, the constitutional framework in the basic law to succeed. That is, they do want to fulfill their promise of universal suffrage. It's in the basic law. You know? And they know that um, the package, if we're, we, we were unable the package to, uh, to pass the package in LegCo last June, trouble would follow, and trouble did. You know? Because there's a ground swell of unhappiness a ground swell of disappointment. I think with the results that some young people voice their anger on the streets. Yeah. Cliff. Hi, Regina. Um, I, I'd like to, uh, to put uh, Florence's uh, first question a slightly different way, if I may. Um, when I interviewed you in 2003, mm -hmm. I asked you whether you would like to be chief executive one day. Really? Your answer... As long ago as that? Yeah. Your answer was, you must be joking. <clears throat> I have no such ambition whatsoever. Yeah. I wonder if, uh, if your answer today uh, to that question uh, would be different. Um, I'd also like to ask, 2003, um, this was just after uh, you had been at the forefront of uh, the government's attempts to introduce national security laws under Article 23. Do you still believe we need national security laws under Article 23? And if so, what is the best time to uh, embark on that again? Well, if I could take the second question first, you know. Article 23 uh, is not about the, about the need, you know. It's about a constitutional requirement, you know. Because Article 23 says, Hong Kong shall on its own uh, enact laws to prohibit a series of national security offenses. The word used is shall. You know, in 2002, when Lord Chancellor of UK, Lord Irvine, called on me, he agreed, look at the text together, and he agreed the word is shall, not may, meaning it's a constitutional requirement, meaning it's a question of when you do it, not whether or, or, or whether or not you do it, you know. But this is no longer my problem. This is now the SAR government's problem. I'm relieved to say, you know. <laughs> so I think um, the government would need to assess, you know, the timing. There never is a good timing, you know. You never know when it's a good timing. Basically, I think a government would need to assess it on the basis of whether there is a, a pressing need for it, you know, quite apart from the constitutional requirement. As the Americans say, whether there is a clear and present danger, and whether you have enough votes in LegCo, enough support in the community for it. And successive administrations have procrastinated because they know it's very tall order. You know. But this remains a question for the administration rather than for me. As for your first question, in 2003, quite apart from the fact that I was feeling quite embattled because of the uh, Article 23, the failed Article 23 campaign, I was seriously already contemplating uh, returning to further studies in 2002. Uh, I was already uh, looking for uh, university admission to graduate programs in the summer of 2002 and also taking my daughter to school, you know, being a single parent. I did not feel I was able to take up any further responsibilities, but um, my circumstances have changed now. Mm. We have a question over here and then in the center. Thank you. My name is Paul Christensen. Um, you talked about the, uh, the pressure on land in, in Hong yeah, Kong. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it seems to me that this um, drives a lot of what the, the government yeah, does. 
but it seems to me also that there's, there's something taken as axiomatic um, behind that, which is never really discussed, which is that there is um, an un, a, a, a spoken policy. Was, uh, Donald Trump originally said that we will have a population of 10 million people by a certain time, and now the figure that people are talking about seems to be 9 million. But yet the natural growth of the population of Hong Kong is negative now. Um, your average woman has less than two children. The, the, the population, if there was no immigration, would shrink. The government's policy, therefore, seems to be to artificially, through immigration policy, increase the population. That essentially seems to be bunches of low-end mainlanders coming in, living in Tin Shui Wai, and getting on welfare. Why is that axiomatically a good thing? Why is it not better simply to say, let the population take its natural growth? That would take a lot of the pressure off the land. In 30 years' time, we will have half a million less people, um, more space for everybody, and without a lot of low-end mainlanders living on welfare. Well, um, you see, if I could give you a bit of background on our immigration policy towards mainland China. In the old days, there was no immigration control across the border. People came and went, you know. And then, because large numbers started coming, the British Hong Kong government started imposing a quota, starting with 50. In the 1980s, it was 75. It was my bosses in security branch who decided to increase it to 150 in stages because of the need for family reunion, for humanitarian reasons, because we were getting so much flack for splitting families, which is also bad for societal development. You know, when you have children left to the care of the grannies, you know, uh, single parent households in Hong Kong. It's for humanitarian reasons that we agree to Im increase the quota to 150 a day. You know, it is. I think the um, take up rate is about in recent years is about 100. You know, but under the basic law, um, it's the mainland authorities who control, who have the final say on how many enter Hong Kong in consultation with us. You know. The same need for family reunion continues. I continue to receive complaints from slit families. So, you know, and we cannot cherry pick. We are unable to cherry pick. That's a problem. Uh, although we are starting to cherry pick a bit more through professional schemes, schemes for admission of professionals and talents from the mainland. You know. But uh, you, you see, your question raises the, the old um, um, issue of, is immigration good for a society? Most economists will tell you immigration is a long-term plus for any society, provided we are able to uh, provide enough resources for the new population we are adding. The trouble with previous administration is that uh, we fail to take a long-term, take a need, uh, take a hard look at the long-term requirements for land and other facilities. I don't know whether I answer your question. Probably not, you know. We have time for just uh, one more right down here. And uh, we'll try to get to one more, if not. If Thank you. Uh, Kim Ming Liu, former journalist. When NPC chairman Zhang Dejiang visits Hong Kong next month, what are the things you plan to tell him? I don't know whether I get a chance to meet him, frankly, you know, or maybe uh, meeting him as one in the background, you know. I think he's um, taken quite a, I think he's been taking advice from Hong Kong people, not just from the Hong Kong government, you know. Um, as the local commentators have pointed out, there appears to be a change of rhetoric coming out from Beijing which I hope will signal a change in policy. Yeah. A question on the veranda. Hi, Regina. Thank you for your time today. And uh, first off, just want to recognize and appreciate the, the time and the sacrifice you've given over the years in public service uh, to the people of Hong Kong. I have three questions. Um, hopefully, I'll go through them really quickly. Okay. First one is, the topic of your speech today is on how to build residents' trust. So if you could name three specific areas you have in mind on how to build Hong Kong residents' trust. Second, 
you mentioned that government in Hong Kong is resistant to change. Uh, given your 30 years of experience in public service uh, in government uh, and your experience in LegCo, what are some suggestions you have that can, that can help the government change this attitude? And the last question is, you mentioned you have, uh, you are focusing on LegCo elections in September. Um, can you share with us your vision uh, or, or highlight some of your vision or your election platform policy uh, manifesto for September this year? Thank you. Well, these are multi-barrel questions, which could take half an hour yeah. to <laughs> respond. I'll um, reply to you very quickly. Uh, I think um, the next administration um, would need to reactivate um, consultation on chief executive election. You know, if Hong Kong reaches agreement on chief executive election by universal suffrage, that would really greatly strengthen Hong Kong people's voice in one country, two systems, and strengthen confidence. You know, that would really help smooth out a lot of wrinkles you know, and build consensus. I think that's a problem that um, any future leader of Hong Kong cannot avoid. Secondly, we also need to address problems relating to our decline in competitiveness, economic competitiveness in many areas, and improve the quality of education. You know? um, because these are fundamental to um, increasing opportunities for young people. Thirdly, of course, with regard to management of the public sector, there's always room for improvement. You know? um, leading the, the civil servants you know, to be better position for change, you know, and uh, to the new requirements of our society. As for my party, we, are, we have a modest um, plan, but um, which is not easy to achieve of fielding three candidates for geographical elections in September, as I've said publicly elsewhere, uh, myself on Hong Kong Island, Michael Tin on New Territories West, and hopefully to get a new candidate elected in New Territories, Michael Tin in New Territories West, and hopefully a new candidate elected in New Territories East. If we could pull that off, that would be that would be quite a significant achievement for a young party. You know. As for our party's platform, full details are on our website except that I would, I would just point out that um, one of the um, central planks, a very important ingredient of our policy platform is um, tackling land and housing shortage. We need a more long-term approach. We're just about to go to two o'clock, but since we are a press club, I'm going to uh, slip in one last question, okay. which is um, rising concerns about the freedom of press in Hong mm. Kong. Do you think we're overreacting, uh, or do you actually see that freedom of press is declining, and how concerning is that? Well, someone, for someone who started working for the colonial government in 1975, I think the press are very feisty these days. <laughs> they are getting feistier and feistier, very aggressive. Where the print or social media, we have a lot to look out for compared to the old days, you know. There may be every now and then isolated incidents, you know, of alleged interference or whatever, which uh, might give rise to some concerns. But overall, I think we enjoy much higher freedom of expression than in the old days. And on that note, uh, Regina Ip, thank you very much for your time and questions and answers today. Thank you. We do have a gift from the club, and we'd like to thank you for coming again. It is not a club tie. <laughs> thank you very much.